Well, good morning. Welcome everybody here to Antioch Baptist Church. Uh, I want to welcome our Facebook family for joining us as well. Uh, as usual, please come join us in the sanctuary if you'd like. Uh, we'd love to have you here with us. Um, we're going to get ready to get going here in just a second, but I think before we do, uh, I think we've got a few birthdays we weren't able to celebrate last week, but we're going to celebrate this week. So, if, uh, anybody had a birthday? Yeah. <laughs> got any recognized. All right, good deal. Um, so we're going to go straight into some announcements. Actually, we only got a single announcement. Um, all the Sunday school literature has been uh, delivered, and it's down here on the front table, so or pew. So come pick that up. I think we've got one more lesson, and then we transfer to our to our new uh, series for the fall. Tra transfer to the fall, boy. Uh, is everybody glad that school's back in? Yes. Yeah. We've got a couple that are happy and one that's not. So. All right. Okay, well, we're going to go right into the prayer list then, and uh, we'll, we'll get things going. Um, we've got a lot of folks on the prayer list. Um, we were talking about that in Sunday school this morning. Uh, there's a lot of people that are still, uh, some of them have got chronic issues that they're trying to deal with, and uh, sometimes just an encouraging word is a good thing for them. So please pick up your prayer list on the back table. Take it with you, and you can... Uh, Pray over it during the course of the week. Um, first is we've got the Jamie Hope family. Uh, we want to remember them. Uh, Rebecca Furch, Steve Gillum, uh, Christy McCoy, uh, Tally Allen, David Griffin, um, Mike Soper, Gary Dameron, Sarah Orr, uh, Bobby Rohr, uh, Janice Rohr, uh, Jen Smith, uh, Becky uh, Mattingly, Elaine Moorhead, Kevin Jones, uh, Sylvia Shepard, uh, Lauren Foster and the baby, Brad Russell, Collins Harper, Warren Thomas, Lisa Crabtree, Nikki Bencini, Hudson Pace, Phil Abel, David Dameron, Trudy McCutcheon, Lisa Jones, Landon Craig, Janice Harris, Bobby Ross, and Alta Ross, uh, Liz Skidmore, Marcy Leonard, Ron Stevens, Erica Black, Amanda Lear, Nancy Nyblack, Ann Steele, Joan Steele, Ann Dameron, Life Care Residents and Staff, Marty Brown, Paul Rudolph, law enforcement officers and first responders, Donna Steele, Sandy Moss, Tommy Myers, our country and world leaders, and unspoken. <coughs> Do we have anybody that we'd like to add to our list this morning? <coughs> I want to thank Don for posting the, uh, the prayer list on our phones. If you, if you don't have that set up uh, to where you can get that prayer list electronically uh, please let one of us know uh, brother robert myself uh, or don and we'll try to make sure that we get you added to the list and includes our facebook family so just let us know um, hearing none let's go to the lord and word of prayer heavenly father lord we thank you for uh, we thank you for this prayer list father we, it sounds like a strange request but lord we thank you for the love that goes behind people being placed on this list. Thank you for the fact that we know that you've got the capacity to work in their lives. Lord, we lift these people up to you, whether it's uh, sickness or whether it's um, mental distress. Or, Lord, whether it's just somebody needs a helping hand. Lord, we just want to lift them up to you. Um, Lord, use us. Use us in this upcoming week. As we talked about in the Sunday school class, Father, we just pray that Utilize the Holy Spirit to give us guidance, 
on an, an inkling that what we need to be doing and how we can be better serving you in this upcoming week. Lord, your son uh, laid down the ultimate price for us. And Father, as we try to, um, to be more like him, to love like him, Lord, we just pray in his name, in Jesus' name, that you give us the strength to do this. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, this is a disclaimer. I did not pick these songs out. Emily, with the help of Clayton, picked all four of the songs we've got today. So, y'all can thank them. And I'll give you a dollar. Anybody can figure out which one the first one is. <laughs> 601. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I'll put it, I'll put it in the offering plate. Okay. 601. Let's stand and sing all three verses. being here we appreciate it very much and I was uh, thinking this week I heard this illustration this week and it was about a glass of water but I'm going to use uh, this eight ounce uh, bottle of water and what the individual what they were talking about is is burdens now when we take on burdens and we know that the Lord and Peter says casting all your care upon him for he careth for you uh, a burden is not too bad at first, like, like this water here, but the longer I hold it out here, the heavier it gets on my arm. And, and if I hold it long enough, my arm will start going numb and it'll start cramping and I'm either going to have to have help hold it up as Moses needed help holding his hands up where they could win the battle. Uh, I would need help to hold that up. And the burdens are like that as well. At first, they're not too bad. I can handle this. It's okay. But then it continues to uh, wait on your mind and your spirit. It continues to increase. And you need help. And one thing about the Lord is that he, he can't erase the memory. He doesn't erase the memory. He doesn't erase maybe the emotion associated with it. But he can help you carry the burden. He can lift your burden. Many of the times in the Bible, that's what it encourages. Peter here is talking to two bishops and elders in First Peter chapter 5. But it can apply to all of us as far as uh, the Bible. We can find passages of Scripture. There are many people bearing burdens. They, they make comment at work, family, friends. Maybe a comment at, uh, here and then. Being in tune with it. Allowing the Spirit to tune your ears to these burdens that people are care uh, bearing and uh, carrying around. And like I said, at first it's not too bad, but the longer you hold on to it, the longer it's out there, it becomes a burden. And you have a story to share with these individuals about how the Lord has helped you through them. I was looking at some statistics. 78% of Americans are living paycheck by paycheck right now. 78%. That's a burden on them and their life. You help alleviate some of this by your gifts that we have, several things that we do and sponsor that you give toward. There was a survey of 700 executives and board members across the United States and this is the answer to the questions they ask. 52% of companies have already enacted hiring freezes. They're no longer hiring, 52%. Four out of 10 have eliminated the jobs that, they, the, that it needs to be filled, but they're not going to fill it, and that's four out of 10 have eliminated that. Uh, they've stopped offering sign-on bonuses for new hires or new employees. 
One half have started laying off uh, or preparing to cut people's jobs, and this is 52% of them. Th these are burdens in people's lives. And we need to be in prayer for them. We need to be encouraging. And see, where we maybe the Spirit will allow us to meet some of those needs and bless these individuals in special ways. The Spirit is powerful. What we what we can do collectively as a church, praying that the Spirit will move and bless us as we get together and gather together because out of that will uh, open up many doors, as Paul said, if they might open a door of ministry, and we'll forget. Apostle Paul was headed one way. I was talking to Brother Bill Miller, and Apostle Paul was headed one way, and God told him to go to Macedonia where he wasn't going. So even some of the greatest apostles get uh, sidetracked sometimes, but he was listening to the Spirit, open to the Spirit, and that's what we need to be as we pray. Lord, uh, be powerful in our assembly. Be powerful among us. Speak to our hearts and encourage us. Because we live in burdens sometimes, and we never know the burdens that people are carrying, but the Lord can help. Let's pray. Father, we do love you, and thank you for hope. Thank you for that possibility to comfort and console, and just to be there in times of burden carrying. We appreciate it. It's scary on our part, because we don't know often what to say or how to encourage, but sometimes our presence and our prayers and our desire to love these individuals past that burden-bearing problem they may have until they allow you to be the one to lift that burden. Be with us this morning. We know that you can be powerful. We've seen it over and over and read it over and over in the scriptures. All that power that is available in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Lord, we just ask for a portion of it this morning among us that we might be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn number 600. All three verses of hymn 600. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saints of earth shall gather over from the other shore. And the road is called the thunder, I'll be there. When the road is called the thunder.
491. Hymn 491, all three verses. Chapter 4, and maybe touching on chapter 11 as well. What does the gospel have to offer me? Let me look, check on my. Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 1. What does the gospel have to offer me? Very good. Uh, search and investigation into the gospel or what we call the gospel. There are four major categories, you might say, in our faith as Christians. And there's, there are a lot of subcategories, a lot of, uh, I guess, topics concerning these four major uh, categories in the Christian faith. One is Jesus, and there are a lot in the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Book of Revelation about Jesus. Salvation is another thing when we study about salvation and uh, what it means, how we achieve it, how we work it out in our lives. Another thing is the gospel. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, the idea about gospel and, and what it means and how we can uh, incorporate it into our lives. And of course, the last thing is discipleship. And all of these are things we struggle with, preach on, <clears throat> teach on uh, about our Christian faith and who we are as the people of God. And uh, I listen to different individuals on social media, atheists, agnostics. The difference in an atheist and an agnostic an atheist says there is no God, and an agnostic would say, I don't know that there's a God, not denying it or agreeing with it. I, I don't know. There's not enough evidence. I listen to debaters and doubters and individuals that say, this is, if, he was, if, there, if he is God, then he wouldn't allow this. <clears throat> if he would God, he would do this. And I'm thinking in my mind, and where do you get this research about gods? Uh, how can you say this is the way God should be? This is the way God should act. This is the way God should perform. If he's God, true God, then he would do this. Where do you get all this information? Uh, I just wonder that you, just off the spur of your mind, because you design your own God. Individuals do that for one another as well, don't they? You've had people probably on you and they were surprised or you were surprised how somebody acted. You were surprised by how, what somebody said. This is who they are. This is how they act. This is what they do. To, to find God, to find Jesus, to look at him and say, this is who he is. And of course, we know it's going to be good. We know that love is going to be a focus of it. We know that he cares for us and uh, reaches down with as much as he can and power that he can to bless us, but he's still not our servant. He is still God. He doesn't act like I want him to act. He doesn't do what I think he should do. He is God, and he acts like God does. Jesus is Savior, and he acts and performs and does and blesses according to who he is, not who I think he should be. That's important. What does the gospel, because that's what he's wound us up in, after salvation, after we accept him as personal Savior, after we understand a little bit at first about who Jesus is, he opens up the gospel, <clears throat> the good news to us. Look in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, this is talking about peace and rest and, and comfort 
and uh, I, I guess a time of relaxation, stress-free moment, a time in your life when you just sit down and breathe and say, that's what he's talking about, rest here. Let us be aware that none of you be found to have fallen short. And you've done this. Sit down more worried. Uh, get up more worried than when you sat down trying to work out problems. He said, this can happen. For we are also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we have believed, entered the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. This is talking about the children of Israel, the Israelites, when he promised what he promised to them. And when you read it, it didn't happen. And the Hebrews writer, Apostle Paul, is explaining or expounding on that fact. Even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in his way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, in that passage, he said, They will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news or the gospel did not enter because of disobedience, he said again, specifies a certain day today, he specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall, will fail into the same pattern of disobedience. For, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The idea of rest. A struggle there with Apostle Paul, <clears throat> with the Israelites, explaining to them how they would look at God and say, He did not keep His promise. He promised to give us rest. He promised to give us peace. He promised all of these things if He was God. And Apostle Paul said, no, wait a minute. God, God promises these things to you. God promises them to you. The gospel, the good news. When we read the word gospel in the Bible or hear it spoken, what do you think of maybe only salvation? But there's many categories and many subcategories of the idea and the elements that exist in the word gospel or good news. It should be seen more as the idea of a pinata. It is one, but yet when you bust it open, it just a lot of them uh, fall, a lot, of, a lot of things fall out of it. That's what the gospel is. It's not about one thing. It's about the many things that we actually have in our life that is available to us that becomes good news over and over. T take the word peace, and that's what he is talking about a little bit here in the idea of rest. The gospel, this single word about peace, found in Philippians, says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Keep your hearts calm. Keep your hearts at rest. Storms and difficulties and burdens are all around you, but Jesus can keep you at peace. 
while you're dealing with these things. Good news is what he's saying here. The idea of good news centered in the fact that Jesus has promised you a happier life. But it's required in the Bible for us to believe that. Believe these promises that he said he would and will do for us. Promises. Second Peter says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life. All things. That yet we often might see in our houses or in our homes or our families things that we desire but we think is pertaining to life. And we'll say, God, if you are God, then you would, and we add those things to it. But through the knowledge of him, Jesus, that he called us unto glory and virtue, that through the knowledge of Jesus, finding out who he is and tapping into that resource, becoming knowledgeable about our Savior, uh, not guessing, not assuming, because that's part of your story or your testimony. The idea that I know who Jesus is in my life and the promises that he has promised me may not be uh, highlighted in your life. You might not think as much about a certain promise that I think about the Lord, but it's there and it excites me and it should excite you when you read those passages of scriptures, the questions that we need answered in our life about the gospel. What, what expectations do I have from the gospel? What would I consider good news from the Lord? What, what would I consider that? And the idea is, are they based upon scripture? Are they based upon the word of God? As I listen to these college students, as I listen to these individuals that question the character and the truthfulness of Jesus, if he was God, he wouldn't allow suffering. Uh, who, who, where do you get that? Do you get that in some ancient text? Do you get that out of some other religion? Did you just pull that out of your hat like a magician? Because the idea in the scriptures must come from the truth. And the Bible reveals the truth to us. And how is the gospel making a difference in my life right now? That's important. To know for individuals looking for answers, for individuals that desire these burdens to be lifted from their life. The gospel makes many promises is to improve the quality of your mortal life while you live here and your moral life as well both of these things it promises that the word of God is quick the word of God does it matter if I miss thy devotion does it matter if I miss church does it matter if I somehow neglect my spiritual life for a while does that really matter what does the scripture say about Jesus? Does it hurt your feelings when people neglect you? Does it hurt your feelings when you're neglected or your words are neglected or uh, they're, you're not, uh, they're not uh, concerned with what you're concerned with? This is just on a person-to-person a -person standard. We're, we're all feel that way. Would not God feel the same way? The gospel claims to be more powerful than anything that you could possibly encounter in this world. The word of God, sharp, sharper and uh, able to penetrate down into your thoughts and your hearts, your innermost ideas and thinking, things that maybe you don't say, things that you don't uh, express because they're so painful, the Word of God can go down into it and, and approach that moment, that time, that burden, and wrap its arms around that thing. The idea of the gospel. The most powerful thing in the world or in any world is what we know that Jesus explained and the Old Testament does is love. 
Nothing more powerful than love. It's a powerful force in the world. Think about what people have done over the idea of love. No more powerful force than that. And God has chosen that. John 3.16 and John highlights that in the book of John and uh, as far as that, in all of his books, he highlights the idea of, uh, of how powerful love is. And you know that in your life, when somebody loves you. you. You get a present, you get a note, you get something through the mail. Somebody remembered you. Somebody expressed a good thought about you. You received something that, I, I didn't know they even knew that. Love is a powerful force. Uh, the first Corinthians chapter 13 highlights that the gospel claims to reveal the truth in order for you to make a uh, informed decision he, it doesn't hide anything here here it is find this out the, these college students all they have to do is open the Bible this is who God is you, you start with that this is informed decision you have been informed about who God you don't have to guess about it Look how he's dealt with nations in the past. Look how he's dealt with prophets and with individuals in the past. Look how he deals with individuals in the New Testament. You, you don't have to guess. This is who he is. The idea and the uh, uh, formed decision would be many individuals went to college and they enrolled in college. I would think months before they gathered different colleges, maybe even years, gathered these colleges and putting them before them and parents and everybody looking at it, uh, money-wise, how far is it from a, a house, uh, what kind of vehicle. The, you, you collected a lot of information, and out of all of that information, you made an informed decision. This is what you need to do. That's what Jesus desires for us to do. Making that informed decision about the gospel and about following Jesus. You don't have to guess where he is and what he's going to do. You don't have to guess about the idea that he loves you and cares for you. Think about the promises in the Bible, the gospel, and how how much of a pinata it actually is as it explodes into the lives of individuals. And you observe that in people and where the gospel has changed so many individuals, improving their life. And uh, others need to hear this story because of their burdens. They don't know which way to turn. And the Lord may have you there this week exactly for that. I'm talking about not untested faith, but things that you know in your life, things that the Lord has comforted you, doors that the Lord has opened for you, impossibilities, miracles if you need it. The Lord still performs miracles. He's still the here, just as powerfully it was in that day. In the, on the thousand year of reign of Christ, when Christ comes back and sets up his thousand year reign of Christ, Isaiah says he's going to do exactly what he did in the first century when he landed. He's going to heal all infirmities, all sicknesses, all infirmities, all ailments. In the millennial reign of Christ, he cures all of those. That's what he wanted to do when he first came, but he needed to inject salvation in there first. And when he comes back this time to set up thousand-year reign, he doesn't have to do that now, so it's open, and he heals. No more hospitals, no more doctors, no more uh, Alzheimer's, no more dementia, no more nursing homes. The peace that God can give, and he will do it, in that sense. And the idea of deliverance from, uh, I read testimony after testimony of individuals that just trusted in the Lord because it was out of their control. There was a man some years ago, his name was Abdul Rahman. He was an Afghan and he was a Muslim, but he came to know the real Savior by some influence of the military over in that vicinity. 
But being a Muslim in his country, he had committed a capital offense. He was arrested and sentenced to death for being a Christian. His family actually turned him in. But he had an option. He had a way out of the death sentence. He had a way to keep his life. And all he had to do was renounce Jesus. And all he had to say was, I don't believe in Christ anymore. I don't really trust him. That's all he had to do. His life would have been spared. But he decided to trust Jesus and the gospel. He decided to meet his maker with the idea this is true. I know the promise of eternal life is true. If I meet it now, that's okay. If I meet it later, that's okay. But I cannot deny the promise that I know he made about my salvation and who Christ is in my life. A couple of months later, is he was uh, released from, from Afghan prison and he was allowed to go to Italy and uh, seek asylum there and all he could do was say there's nothing that I did I I don't know who was working on the other end but all I know is I received the results of it isn't that what the gospel is the, maybe this week you might not need a life-saving promise from the Lord you might not need a life-saving faith to trust him with the God with uh, your life or your family but the gospel is there to know that even in the small and the large trusting the Lord if God would uh, if God would allow to put this man to death he would have spent eternity in heaven because he did not deny him have you ever wanted to um, promises in the Bible, but found that you didn't have enough faith maybe to trust the Lord. Your faith is just not large enough and big enough in order to trust Him. Andy Stanley wrote a book, Visioneering, God's Blueprint for Developing. He says this and defines what faith is to him. <clears throat> he said, confidence that God is who He says He is and that he will do what he has promised to do. Faith is not a power or a force. It is not a vehicle by which we can coerce God into something against his will. It is simply an expression of confidence in the person and character of God. It is a proper response to the promise of revelation of God. It is what God has promised you. And, and you know there's going to have to be something on the other end. You don't just believe this and say this is true and step out on it. There has to be an affirmation. When somebody promises you something. When they say you call me if you need something. When, when they say listen I'm here for you. Uh, you, 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 there's an affirmation there. And when you act on that, when you call them, it's based on the promise that you have received from them. You told me to call and I'm calling on you because you said to call on you. You, you said that you would help me in time of need and, and I'm calling on you now. In the same way, that's what God is doing when you find that promise and weep and cry before him, Lord, you have promised this to me. I'm asking for your blessing. I'm asking for uh, what you desire for me in my life. The promises in scripture, they, they may not be exactly to you, but there are some in there that are pinpoint to every Christian alive. This is a universal thing. And it means that I can claim it as a child of God in that sense. What do you do when your faith is too small, though? You know, we have confidence in the Lord. Good news for the individuals. One thing that is good about is that your faith can grow. Isn't that wonderful to know? I don't have enough faith in trusting the promises of God. Good news. Your faith can grow. 
2 Corinthians 10, not boasting of things which without our measure, that is, of other men's labor, but having hope. When your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. That when your faith is increased, it's not a stable, stagnant piece of, uh, I guess, uh, spirituality in our life. Faith is always and can be always expanding and moving and blessing and working. It's, it's active. It's not passive in one's life. The more you see him work in other people's life, the more you'll see it, uh, the more you'll have hope in your life. When you see God working in somebody's life, you'll say, wow, you know, I, I want that. When you see God blessing somebody in their life, wow, I want that. When you read books about uh, individuals that didn't have very much faith, but they believed because somebody else, and they saw what somebody else uh, experienced because they trusted the Lord. I wonder how many individuals believed in the Lord because of Abdul belief in God and they saw what God was doing in his life and, and how God delivered him and gave him freedom. How many he actually led to the Lord just by being a Christian and living up to what the Bible says. That gives us hope. The disciples' faith grew as they saw what Jesus did to help others. Notice that in the Bible when you read it. They saw this and, and they were at all too. Wow. Did you see what he did? Yeah. They began, they began believing in what, who he said he was. I am this. I'm a savior. And he revealed to them several things and they would stand back in awe and say, he is the son of God. He is that individual. And they began believing as he healed these various individuals. As he told John the Baptist, what, what should we tell John? His disciples said, what should we carry back to jail and tell the disciples or tell John? Tell him. The blind received their sight and he went down through the list. The apostles were standing back listening to that and saying, wow, you know, he's right. That, that's exactly who he is. That's exactly what he promised in scriptures to do, and that's fulfillment of that individual as a savior, as a person that knows uh, how to uh, bring salvation to the world, gave them confidence today because of what is experiencing in people's lives. You know of people that's been blessed. You can look at these individuals. You can look at their lives before and look at it now and, and you should see some kind of improvement in their life and their, their conduct. Being faithful today more than yesterday. The idea of being consistent is growing in the faith and what the Lord has to offer us. Faith growing. The elements that the gospel has to offer each and every one of us. In the short term and the long term as well. But we must be able to do both. There are some short term things that God promises and we're just excited, you know. We're excited. Christmas is coming. But it's a little bit long term now, probably not as far as what uh, we might think it is, just right around the corner. But to a child, when you start telling them Christmas is coming, it's like an eternity. How They'd be worried you to death about when Christmas is coming. The idea of short term and long term, realize those are things that are incorporated into God. Faith can grow, and can grow if you ask and realize that Jesus is asking you to do certain things in your life. And if you'll do that, and be consistent with that, that may not be an enormous thing, it may be some small thing that he asks you to be consistent in, 
in your life. And out of that consistency, he blesses you. The idea of the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, how these trials and tribulations, the individuals that were mentioned in Hebrews 11, 32 through verse 40, all the great individuals that were mentioned, Gideon, Samson, David, <clears throat> Samuel, many of the prophets. Verse 33 tells us that it was by faith that these uh, individuals accomplished some of these awesome things. When we look at them and say, wow, they are giants. But you know what? These giants started off with just as much faith as what you have today. <laughs> They didn't have any, they didn't start off with all that faith. That, that wasn't poured into them all at once. Like Peter, they, they were doubting, like doubting Thomas. He was doubting like Peter, always questioning and pushing and, and aggravating Jesus during his lectures in life. These giants started off and their faith grew because they were ordinary people. They grew into it, and when God was ready, they were ready to step into it. They weren't any great people. Uh, Samson wasn't a great individual. David wasn't a great individual. He was a normal individual, or these people were normal individuals with the sinful attitudes and sinful actions that we have as well today. 1 John 4 says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can overcome some of the burdens in your life, and you can help others as well. Notice verse 35 and 38 in Hebrews 11, or I'll just tell you what it says. There are many names mentioned there as it's outlined, but I want you to notice one word, others. Others. These others had a different kind of growing faith that they experienced and blessed others. Different than Gideon, different than David, different than Samuel, different than Abraham, the others. These others it listed, they were tortured, they were jeered and made fun of. They were flogged. They were chained. They were put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were killed. They found themselves in destitute. They were persecuted. They were mistreated. They were about to face these things because they trusted, totally trusted in the gospel and what he said God was able to do, others. You, your name will be among these others in heaven. We, we might not have it written in the Bible. It might not be seen there in some of the things that you might have to overcome and uh, overcome uh, in your life. But the others is going to be in heaven Jesus is going to say and read this list of others and say, well done, thou faithful servant. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to his word. Faithfulness to what God says. Faithfulness to the promises that he's promised. Hebrews 11.40 says, God had provided something better for us. That, that is an encouraging thing. To be given a gift and then said, I've got something better later on for you in this. What hope, what faith, knowing that tomorrow might be better, his promises will be better than today. And if it's not as good, then the promise goes on and extends to the next day. I was reading a story. I was raised during the time of a clown on television on television his name was edwin cooper he was famous across america from 1959 to 1962 very few knew his real name 
Coming from a family of circus clowns, Mr. Cooper began performing when he was just nine years old. After a few years with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, he became a popular actor on television as Bozo the Clown. And on his TV show, he had a special message for his buddies and partners. That's what he called them every week. He would say, get checked for cancer. Every week, his message would be to them in his closing statement, get checked for cancer. But it was just a message for somebody else because Mr. Cooper was too busy working and he neglected his own advice. By the time his cancer was discovered, it was too late to be treated. Edwin Cooper died at just 41 years old from a disease he had warned many others to watch out for. 41. Bozo the Clown. In closing Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, How shall we escape, or anybody escape, if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, and I might add, that experienced his promises. Let's bow our heads. Father, we do love you. Thank you for this time and this moment where we can experience the gospel, the many things that are available to us as we break down and we open and unfold this manifold word called the gospel. Thank you. It's exciting to open gifts. It's exciting to receive them. And oftentimes it's exciting to see what was in there. We are excited that the gospel the presence that you give us each day, each moment, each morning that we rise, the potential of receiving good news about something that you have provided for us throughout that day, a gift from one whom loves us very much. And we look forward to it, and we thank you. Look into the hearts of your children, See what they need right now. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing what number? 465. 465.